Now, let's talk stipple. Um, what I am going to be doing today is to, um, to show you folks a strategy that is, um, it's sort of a, a bread and butter technique for scientific illustrators. And I'm going to be sort of showing you kind of some formal approaches to stipple and um, then how that can be kind of more loosely handled um, in, our, in our field journals. Um, and also show you uh, stipple for, um, for I'm, I'm a, uh, if, if the diagnosis had been around when I was a small person, um, in addition to being uh, identified as dyslexic, I would have been, um, ADHD. I was bouncing all over the place. And um, stipple is something that takes like, you kind of got to get into the stipple space. Um, but I'm going to be showing you um, stipple for the impatient um, as well. And so if you have a hard time just uh, sitting still and, and you're thinking like, uh, this stipple thing is not for me, um, this will be speed stipple. And <clears throat> It'll be fun. So what is stipple? Stipple is dots. Stipple is pointillism. Stipple is putting in little dot, 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 and gradients of dots to suggest dark and light value. And by changing where things are dark and light to be able to show the planes of an object. The values on an object are very useful in showing the planes. If I've got an object, if you look at, say, my head here, there's light coming through the window here. And just about here, you can see um, the, um, that the, the, the light from the window kind of ends abruptly. And I've got light from another window coming in here. It's interesting. This one's more white. This one's more orange. And you can see that one ending here. The reason that these kind of end here is because the sides of my head are sort of, the head is sort of flat planes in here. And there's another plane here. And right along here and right along here are where the planes of my head change their angles. So the light and dark shows us, describes to us the changes in the angles of planes around us. So planes meaning the surface, not planes as in, right? The planes as in the surface of an object. These change and that, that, um, that's what, uh, one reason why the values are so helpful in this. To help you with this workshop, um, there is a handout. This will look familiar to people who are here last week. We used cross hatching to create values on this lion worksheet. And, um, but because we can't get um, enough of uh, these lion skulls, we're gonna be using the lion skulls again today to create our stipple drawings. Um, now, if you, let's put into, uh, let's put the, the, into the chat. Um, Avea, would you please put into the chat the link to the lion skull? So if you just go to the, the event description, boink, click on the lion skull things, it'll bring up the lion skull ready for you to print out. Just let's drop that URL into the chat. So if you don't have it, there's still a chance that you can print it out. Um, if you don't, um, you can uh, do a ton today just with drawing things on, on your page. Last time when we did the uh, cross hatching thing, Ray Bonto was there just sketching everything and and uh, created all the illustrations and the cross hatching on top of those in the same time frame that everybody else was um, just doing our hatching. So it is possible to do, um, but the um, but that that worksheet can be helpful for you. So that's the lion skull PDF, All right? Um, by the way, the, uh, if you are watching this later on a recording, if you go to johnmirlaws.com and go to my store, there is um, a, uh, there's a, a, an archive of all the old worksheets for my classes 
in there and they're free downloads. And so you just go to the worksheet archive item on my store. There's a little drop down menu and you're going to go to the um, lion skull PDF. You can print this out. And so you at home can follow along with your stipple. So um, a handy, handy little PDF. I'm gonna suggest that you print that out now. Um, so if you're watching this at a future time, you can stop time and then uh, go print that out. Come on back. And here we go. Now that you've done that, let's get stippily. Um, we're going to start just by thinking about um, tones and values and do a value study. Um, and then we're going to look at how to transfer that value study into stipple. Here we go. All right. Here are my uh, here are my my lion skulls. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a I've got a, a pencil here with some darker lead in it. Um, this has got two B lead in it, and, and um, you can also just grab any sort of pencil that is on your desk. It doesn't have to be any special fancy uh, drawing pencil. Just grab any pencil. And what we're going to do is we're going to put some shade and shadows onto this skull as sort of a value map. And in this, I want to be thinking about where are my darkest places going to be, my um, lightest places going to be, um, medium places, so I'm going to be thinking some places I'm going to be pushing my darks with a real dark. Um, there we are. Um, other places, my value, I'm going to go for a lighter value. And other places, I'm just going to go for a really light value. So I'm not so much worried about blending these into each other. Um, as a fade, um, I'm going to be thinking about sort of placing my, my, my darkest darks and my lightest lights or, and, my, um, and these patterns. Once I get this mapped out, oh, then there's going to be other places that are just white. So that's a four value scale. I usually in my drawings just think about three values or four values. My brain really can't handle much more than that. And let's place some of these darks on this. Um, so here inside the nasal cavity of this lion, I am going to start with kind of darker dark down in there. And then I'm going to fade that out to uh, step two. So we're going to call this uh, step one, two, three, and four. So I'm going to go from number one to number two down in there. Maybe I will have number one just kind of uh, also kind of curve across the top there. So there's one and two up there in the nasal cavity. I'm going to put a little bit more one down in here. Some real deep darks kind of coming, extending over to this edge. Maybe a little bit of one back here behind this. Uh, this is in the eye socket, so it's a big depression. And I'm going to drop some two into here, some two into here. And a little bit of two coming down here. I'm going to put a little bit of three, value number three. Around that edge. On the, uh, the, the <clears throat> sagittal crest on top of this lion skull, I'm going to put a little bit of two along the top edge here, fading into three. Leaving a little bit of a white trim along the top of it. And then I'm going to take a little bit of value number three and just wrap that kind of around the bottom of the brain case here. A little bit more of maybe some two coming down as well. 
right in here is a, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more, Oop. is what's called the auditory bulla. Um, it is a place where the lion's ear bone is. There's a, there's a hole there in the side of the head and with a little lip around it. And it's a rounded thing. So I'm going to put a little bit of one in the hole. And I'm going to put a little bit of two around the bottom edge of that. And a little bit of two in the shadows on the ball that is the, the spinal cord is going to be attached to. So again, what I'm doing is I'm essentially mapping out where I'm going to have my darkest darks, my lightest lights. Um, going back into here, there's this bone here has a, sort of a big base that comes up into here. I'm going to put a little bit of three up on the side here, and a little bit of three coming up here, a little bit of three in here, and a little bit of three around the back side of this, the base of that tooth. Leaving a little bit of an uh, the bottom of this is kind of turning down. So I'm going to be putting a little bit of maybe two, maybe, yeah, three, probably two or three. Yeah, it's more two, um, kind of along the base of this. And a little bit of three in a depression here. A um, little bit of, there's a little bit of a depression here where, um, between these two teeth coming up in here. So a little bit in there. And then I'm going to put some two along the bottom side of this zygomatic arch. The light is coming from the front here. The back of the zygomatic arch here is gonna be in shadow. I'm gonna go into a little bit of two, uh, fading into three up there. But the underside of it back here, I'm going to go back to two. What about the teeth? This back tooth here, I'm going to give that a little bit of one, I mean, sorry, a little bit of three, um, and then a little bit of three on the side of this tooth here. That one in the back gets more shadow on it because it's, I want it to be sort of feeling it's, it's pushed further back. You're not really seeing it as well. Um, there's a shadow, there's a cast shadow across this part of the mandible here. Um, and so I'm going to put that in as a, uh, a one, Get or maybe a two. Yeah, probably best to have that be a two. I'm going to put some one in here back in the, on the part of the jaw that is the far side of the jaw and have a little bit of two then you notice that because I have assigned these lights and darks numbers I'm being much more deliberate about where I'm putting light and where I'm putting dark there's a tendency just to kind of oh I'm in a shade from light to dark um, but you're not really paying as much attention to where you're putting those values. But if you kind of give yourself a little discrete number system, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, um, then you are going to, uh, there is a little bit of one back here. Um, that will help you be more deliberate about how hard you are pressing. I'm going to put a little bit of um, three going down the side of this into this little depression here. And I'm going to put a little bit of two up along the leading edge of it. The bottom part here, uh, I'm going to put a little bit of a hint of some one in here. I want this to kind of round 
away from you. So I'm going to put a little bit of two down here. And then lastly, a little bit of one on this side of this tooth, a little bit of one back there as well. So what I've done is I've made myself a value map of the skull. Oh, there's one other thing I want to do. I'm going to drop a little bit of two into here and fade that out to one. I'm going to also put a little bit of one along the side of this nose bone sticking up here. Get one in here, and we'll give you a little one in here. There we go. So by being deliberate about where I'm putting in one, two, three, or four, that is helping me um, just be more on purpose with what values are going where. And that sculpts, that sculpts this skull. Now, the advantage of doing this with my pencil is that it is fast. Um, and pencil is, is very, uh, I, it's, it's easy to get lights and darks with my pencil. I can, when I press hard, I get darker. When I press lighter, I get light. The disadvantage of this from a scientific illustrator's point of view is, or, or, or from a media point of view, this, this approach is that, it, let's say if I'm drawing with a pen, I can't really use the same system of just press harder and get darker because the, um, with a pen, it is all light or dark, right? Um, it's either on or off. So I can't get these sort of gradations with, with, with this, with, with just drawing with a pen. Um, another disadvantage is that if I put this on a Xerox machine and make a reduction of it, so I reduce the size of it. So illustrators will often draw a large picture larger than it will be in the publication. They then reduce the size and it kind of tightens everything up. The thing that's come is sort of a problem then with gradations of value is that lights and darks will get unexpectedly blotchy when you reduce it. Um, the, the algorithms of sort of making something this, this different size, it, all, it sort of, it, it, it makes the reproduction of those values a little bit more confusing. In addition to that, um, the, um, I forgot exactly what I was going to say, but in addition to that, there's something else and it's very interesting and maybe it'll come back later. So, um, uh, so this, I'm going to say to myself, what can I do if I want to do something like this? Um, oh yeah, I remember what I was going to say. The other thing is that these lights and darks are also hard to re reproduce. Um, a Xerox machine, you know, it'll, some lights, it will, there'll, there'll be a certain point where it doesn't pick that up. It's too faint. And you'll have some things, some shadows that will get totally lost. So you're at the mercy of the reduction machine or reduction software to sculpt, to, to re-sculpt your values. And that's why one of the places that Stipple comes in. What Stipple is, is using series of dots to show lights and darks. And what I'm going to do is I've got several pens here. I'm going to be using a Pigma Micron, uh, the, the, uh, the, o point, the, the, the 0.03 size, that's the medium size. There's a larger size, it's 0.5. Um, there's a super small size that's 0.005. I'm going to be using this, this medium size one, the 0.03. And I'm going to be putting a series of dots onto um, this, this, this object. 
Before I do that, I'm gonna, let's do just a few little experiments with what it's like to create value with dots. So um, I'm gonna give myself a dot and I'm then going to put a few dots near it. So try on your page, just making a little group of dots. Don't go dot, 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 dot. For this, you actually have to place your dots. So place them side by side. So there's a little bit of white space between your dots. Try not to let those dots touch. A couple of mine just already have. That is stipple. So um, when, uh, if I get my dots closer together, if I get my dots closer together, I get a darker spot. if my dots are further spaced apart. I get a lighter spot. And now give yourself a little box. And what you're going to do is you're going to go from an area of higher concentration Actually, let's try this. Let's start just with, <clears throat> here's some black. And then make that black edge dotty. And then we're going to kind of go out into this dot zone. And I'm going to try to get it to start to fade. So as I'm going along here, my dots are going to begin to spread out more. And what you get is a dark to light gradation. Sometimes that barrier, when it goes into pure black, feels really, really harsh. And if you take a white gel pen, I make a couple of little dots in that of white in the dark, it softens that edge a little bit. So I can also drop some lights into my dark. If I go really fast, I sometimes kind of get these little lines, right? I get these lines. That's considered not good stipply form. So in stipple form, they want them not to be little lines. They want them to be dots. Um, sometimes this, but if, if you kind of like this texture that you're getting with those lines, then absolutely you can do this. As a matter of fact, there's nothing wrong with kind of, you can make in an area of gradation, a, a gradation with all with little lines. That's the texture you're going for. 
Um, but just sort of be aware that that is something that you're intentionally doing rather than have everything be smooth and then every once in a while there's a little dash in there. That's gonna look weird. So consistency, as Alfonso Dunn often talks about. Alfonso Dunn, by the way, wonderful uh, pen and ink illustrator, um, is, is really important. So we're gonna try to avoid the little lines in that. And I'll show you a couple of strategies that people use. One is, if you think of, I'm going to make this, uh, you know, this part of my jaw, or I'm going to take my, my nose area here, I'm going to put my shadows on that. Um, you start, you kind of get in here and you start making, you start making some dots. And what's going to happen is your brain is going to start to rebel against this slow pace. And so what you want to do is kind of get yourself just to accept that stipple has its own pace. And what you want to do is just breathe and relax your jaw, relax your hands and sit there and kind of zen out on placing some dots. Just kind of, we have to relax yourself and kind of go at stipple pace. Stipple is a very meditative thing. Sometimes people will put on gentle music and get their stipple on. And if you go da 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 da, it's going to end up looking kind of like chowder. So take your time, place your dots, and you sometimes can look at something and kind of oh, it's a little bit bright there. I'm going to just carefully come in there and place a dot. It's a little bit bright there. I'm going to come in there. That's good. What about here on the side of this little museum? Um, generally speaking, we try to avoid patterns that come up in the stipple dots. But every once in a while, they will sneak in there. Um, but we try to avoid it. One way people have of doing that is by doing dots. You can avoid kind of accidentally getting a pattern by doing your dots in groups of three. So they'll do a little triangle, another little triangle, another little triangle. And this kind of gets you out of grid form. So Jack, just an observation. It's a little bit hard to see um, as you were placing the dots only because their pen is directly up. Yeah, um, if the more that I, I know it doesn't work, up, yeah, <laughs> the more that I have my pen up, the I get better rounder dots. They can end up if, if my fiber tip point is a little bit mm, smished, I can get weird shaped dots by kind of going on the side. Um, but sometimes people will intentionally put in lines of dots. Like let's say I wanted to suggest that this was a rounded form here. Um, you can do this with your stipple dots. Um, and I'm going to kind of arc these across here. So you see there, there I've kind of been putting these a little bit more in lines. And that's gonna suggest maybe a little bit that there's, there's a rounding form in there. Um, let me try to do that a little bit more extremely down here. Let's say that this, I wanted this to be kind of curving in. 
I can follow the contour of this with some of my lines. Yeah, that's sort of showing it better. See how that kind of curved stipple line is doing double duty of putting in a little bit of value, but it's also saying that this business here is, is rounded. But the, generally speaking, that, that approach of, um, of the little kind of triangles of dots and putting your dots in in groups of three is a very useful, a useful way to kind of go about starting to add tone to this. It's not fast, is it? Nope. I'm going to strengthen the shadow along the bottom edge of this just a little bit with a few more dots in there. This is a bigger pen here. And I am going to, with it, just create some areas of dark. And then come off of that, soften that edge with a little bit of stipple. And I want this. little edge here to be kind of crisp with a just little ridge along it. And now I'm going to be just carefully placing my stipple dots below this. If you find yourself just getting really impatient, um, one reason why we feel impatient is because we don't get any kind of sense of immediate completion on things. And so you feel like you're just stippling forever. So one way around that is to give yourself just a little mini project. If I'm gonna be shading this whole thing dark and stippling, what if I just break off a little section here and then I can just, I don't have to do the whole thing. I'm just gonna do this little part. Breathe. Ah, oh, okay. I just got a little now, a little hit of dopamine because I completed a project. I had blocked that little part off for myself. And now I've done it. Now I can just do this next section. I'm going to do this part here. I don't have to do the whole thing. I'm just going to get in here and do to do, place my dots. One, two, three. One, two, three. Oh, I just finished another little section. Now I'm going to do that over here. So if you break it into little zones, don't make a tight little kind of dotted line around something because then that line will show up. But just sort of a, a few little dots, you can kind of give yourself a you know, your next target zone. Slow down and place your dots. So it's not da 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 Curious, on audio, is it better? I've just changed my microphone. Is this a better microphone to use? Yeah, we can hear you better here. Okay, great. So I've just changed mics. Um, so there is stipple across this thing, get some little bit up into here. Now, is there any 
places that I want this to be uh, a little bit darker in here, a little bit darker in here. I'm going to bring a few little white dots into that black section. There it is. So little zone by little zone. I'm intentionally leaving a little bit of a white edge here. And I'm going to have this get more pale as it comes out of this direction. So my dots just get further apart. I'm going to do one more piece as demo in this, in this little scoop, scoopy area. So again, I'm trying to get this darker shadow that's going to fade out. So in here, I have a darker shadow. And that is going to fade. Stipple's a slow process. But if you're in the right mindset, it's really meditative. If you find yourself sort of feeling hasty, then maybe it's not the right day to do stipple. But if you are, you make yourself some, avoid caffeine, a uh, nice little warm drink and can sit down, play some music and you can drop in your stipple. <laughs> I'm not gonna do this entire skull right now. Um, but I'm going to show you one other area, and that is on the tooth here. I'm going to use, um, I want this tooth to feel a slightly different texture than um, than the bone that is next to it, because it's got this kind of gloss, it's an, an, an enamel, and that makes it kind of glossy. So what I'm going to do is deliberately on this, um, might even change to a finer point pen. I'm going to, I'm going to make a series of little dots that are kind of clearly more in rows. See how it feels more random up here? And I've switched to these finer little dots.
and it just sort of suggests a little bit of a different texture, maybe a smoother texture. those teeth. Now, what if you want to go a little bit faster? Um, well, if you use a, th a thicker pen, um, the you really get the sense that you're looking at polka dots. And if you're doing something that has a very rough texture, like a, a block of stone, um, the kind of sandstone, that might be a, a great way to handle it. But on something like the skull, these are really going to, with the large dots, are going to start to just read as those are, those are big spots. And it feels a little bit less like, let me zoom back. Notice when I zoom back here, bazoop, bazoop, that our brains really start to see those as gradations of value. And And so we see that as gradations of value instead of um, as dot, 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 dot. But if you've got, um, if you have really big dots, then you, 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 you lose that effect. Um, I am now going to show you this. You need to sharpen a pencil, so in a moment. I'm going to be sharpening this pencil. This is a barrel Prismacolor Black 935. So it's the black Prismacolor pencil. I'm going to get this little beastly sharpened. And this is for speed stipple. Um, very often when I sharpen a Prismacolor pencil, I will then just take the tip for a little bit and spin it on a piece of paper that gets any kind of uh, really rough, kind of bumpy uh, edge smoothed down. And then it's going to uh, not be as, have such a great tendency to chip, chip, chip on me. I um, have to cap my pens, cap your pens, good habit. But what about speed stipple? Um, this, um, I'm going to use a tool that you probably don't have in your home right now, but want to let you know that this is available if you are doing something where you are going to be having to do a lot of things and, and stipple, or you really kind of like this look, but don't have the patience for it. This next media is for you. And I have a piece of paper here, but this is not ordinary paper. This is what's called coquille board or stipple board. And it has embossed into the paper a very fine but stiff texture. And so what I can do is I'm going to take a little piece of paper so I can rest my hand on it. And let's zoom down on this coquille board. And watch what happens when I use this black Prismacolor pencil on this textured surface. Let's zoom down on that a little bit more. You see that? Let's make that a little bit stronger. So I'm pressing a little bit harder.
If I want something to be really dark, I can push that with some pen. And what you then get is the texture of that paper creating your stipple. So it's called coquille board or stipple board. You can find this in some art supply stores. And so I'm going to just come along here. I can come up here and a little bit up in here. And so you can shade just like you would with a, because I'm using this black Prismacolor pencil, it very quickly goes to a, a rather dense dark black. And that reproduces very well. So if you're looking for something that you want to reduce and put in a, uh, you, that you then want to, you know, photocopy or something like that, um, or have a, a reproduction in a book, this will work very well for you. Isn't that cool? So those shadow areas have this micro texture in them that lets a little bit of pattern light in. And it's really fast. Isn't that crazy? Um, so here in this eye socket, you can see how there are these sort of little worms of texture that are put through there. Let's get this whole eye socket dark. Um, when I was working on my field guide about the Sierra Nevada, um, I actually wish I'd kind of gone and gotten this before this class. I did a number of my illustrations actually on coquille board. Um, and what I would do is I would watercolor on top of the coquille board. And then uh, I would first draw my, my drawing on the coquille board. I would then come along with a little bit of watercolor and, uh, and put that watercolor on it so it would give you sort of solid colors. And then um, I could put highlights on. And uh, if I was, I did this with all my insects and the, uh, the coquille board would take the uh, watercolor very, very well. I would let that completely dry. And then I would um, give it highlights with pencil. And this coquille board texture kind of gave you the, the hint of the little kind of slightly pebbled surface of, of insects. Um, <clears throat> so that's, this is a, a, a wonderful and very fast drawing medium. It gives you much of the effect of stipple. I wanted to, rather than have everybody kind of run out and get it initially, 
wanted to show this to you and so that if you then decided that's a medium I really do want to play with, I want to experiment with that, that you'd be able to. But so where I want it to be really dark, give it a little bit of ink. Back up from that. And see that you get uh, you get cool effects, and you can get them fast. So sometimes sold, sold under the name Coquille board, sometimes illustration board. And there you have it. Um, let me back out from that a little bit more and you'll see that and when it reduces, it feels, your brain interprets it as, as sort of a, um, as, as shades of gray, instead of all these little mousy little lights and darks. Fun medium, yeah. Um, let me bounce over to camera and uh, that's that's an introduction to stipple dot, 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 you're placing your dots, you're not just going, blah, 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 blah. right? Um, being, the, the process will be more successful if you originally have a map of where you want it to be dark and where you want it to be light. Because when you're in there just kind of going, I'm putting in my dots, you'll kind of get lost in that little process. But if you're thinking this region is number two dark, right? Then your brain going, okay. And then you're now, oh, I'm going over the boundary of that. I'm now in my number three dark, All right? You'll be placing those darks. And if you place those darks, it will more successfully sculpt the surface that you're doing. Um, and um, remember, you can also use um, a white gel pen to add um, a few little stipples of light into the darks as well. And that's a, a, a wonderful way to show value and structure. Again, it takes a lot of time and you have to be in the right mindset. Sometimes I really enjoy doing stipple. I'll be like, hmm. I'm in sort of like stipple bliss and everything just fades away. Like if you need to just kind of clear your mind and it's been one of those days and you can just, you can, you can get lost in stipple. And that can be that can be great. Um, if you're wanting to like give me results, it's not a stable day. But you can do this, play with it. And I hope that this is a useful tool that you can incorporate into your repertoire. Um, let's jump over to our community cam and um, see if there are any uh, first uh, about this whole subject of stipple. Um, any thoughts, comments? Um, ideas about that. And um, then um, we'll see if there's anybody that would like to share something in their journal. So if you'd like to share um, something uh, that you've done with Stipple or, or what you did, or if you have a, um, a question, just raise your hand and um, I can Colin, you can, so you can just have your camera on and wave at your screen, um, or 
you can um, um, you can use the raise hand function under reactions. So there's a reaction button. And if you press that, um, I see that uh, Linda and um, uh, let's let's uh, start with 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 Linda. Um, Linda, I'm going to um, allow you to unmute, and then I'd like to bring you into the conversation. <laughs> Hi there, good to see okay. you. Okay, hey there, how are you guys doing? Uh, a few years ago, my grandson and I took this uh, illustration class from this. Uh, um, he was like a full on medical illustrator, and um, and. Uh, one of the techniques, I, I was looking quickly, but it wasn't accessible in my studio. Uh, one of the, the exercises we did was uh, drawing a picture of a frog. And then when we did the stippling part, he took tracing paper and just put it right over the illustration because we shaded the illustration. And, and it was it was an amazing guide to get like what you're talking about doing it quickly. And, and it was really, it was like they, he was using all the proper materials. So uh, the, the tracing paper was not the flimsy kind you- It was, you it was Duraline had. drafting film. It was really, it was a real deal. But it was, it was so amazing to quickly do that, that now that we're talking about the stippling and adapting that as more of a technique and how the reproduction part of it is so effective when you're you know, copying it, I, I would probably go back in some of my best of nature journaling things that I felt like were of note. I would might go back and do that quickly stippling with the, the tracing paper, but I thought it's a, it's a good technique and it's, it takes it like, um, well, it just made it grab and go. You could do a, a lot more. Uh, I would probably do a lot more stippling. And then your comment about being in the stippling state of mind <laughs> noted <laughs> yes <laughs> do yeah, not so, sometimes we're just not first. there uh, no no and and i admit sometimes i am not there and it it looks like something not 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 a word that i've used in this in this nature journaling <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the results are not ideal okay <laughs> yeah so if, if 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 you're looking at something and you're trying to do stipple but you're not in the stipple zone you're going to have hasty um, you, you, you have to stipple like an ant. You just have, you can't be hasty. You just kind of take your That's time. That's right. And I placed a dot. Ooh, <laughs> I placed another dot. What will I do next? I think I'll place Oh, in the, the, in the drawing I was looking for, the other thing that I really loved about it is that uh, because I already had this drawing that was really solid underneath it, I could just have it be no lines at all. It was all stipple. And that was super, super fun. So, uh, because it's, they're like, uh, I love doing lines, I, like I'm a line gal, but having it be kind of soft and formed was, um, I don't know, there's something really dear about that. So I highly recommend getting out and trying that technique. That, that, that's great. And so I would, I would recommend for, um, <laughs> if, you're, if you're doing that one paper, one uh, tracing paper surface that works really well, is something called duraline. It's a drafting film. Okay. Um, so it's a little plasticized, it's a plastic transparent film that you could put over things. And it has a, um, a good uh, surface for receiving pen. Um, and because the paper doesn't bleed, um, if you put a little ink dot down and you've got very fibrous cottony paper, it will then expand <laughs> okay. a little bit. Yeah, that's and right. you don't want, so this, you, you put your dot down and it's going to stay right where it is. Okay. Um, and uh, that uh, can be good. So, and, and Volters, send me your address. I've got a package of Duraline, which you can also do stipple on to send you for your underwater drawing practice. Uh -huh. But I need Under that, um, I need that, uh, that address in order to be able to send this off to you. Um, okay. So yeah, thank you so much for You're those. Welcome. You're welcome. That, Glad that, to share. Uh, that suggestion. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what a fun memory. Um, I'm now going to bounce back over to the gallery view. Um, Sandra, um, hey there. Good to see you. I'm going to um, add you into the spotlight here. And hold on a second. I need to allow you to. Now you can unmute. 
There we go. You are unmuted. <laughs> well, um, old timers remember the days in graphic art where we use something which I think was called Zipatone. And it was a sticky film that you laid down and cut out very carefully with your exacto knife. And that it would come in uh, various uh, densities for dots. And I had my fill of that. I was <laughs> very, very happy for my own art to sit there and very carefully stipple. Uh, yeah. I find I find it very relaxing and soothing uh, to do it on my own artwork, not not on uh, any commercial stuff. Yeah, you, know, you, you yeah you don't want to be up against a deadline with stipple. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you, you, you're 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 right. It, it can be when you're when you're in the the, the stipple zone. It's it's. It's it's a peaceful place. Um, Meditative, maybe. Yes, but but if somebody says like I need that by four thirty, is it's not going to come out well. <laughs> yeah, that's that's when you're like, give me the stipple board, give me the stipple board. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, spotlight. Um, let's. Um, I'm going to go over to the gallery. Uh, any other thoughts or comments about Stipple um, and this approach? If so, just raise your hand and um, uh, we will bounce over to you. And not seeing any Stipple related questions, um, does anyone in our community have a nature journaling page that is, um, that you wanted to 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 share uh, to to share with us. If so, just hold it up. Let's first bounce over to Kate. See what's in your um, your sketchbook. Oh, we're getting we're having fun with. Um, there you go. Let me remove my screen so we can make that this 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 fungi celebration um, a little bit bigger. Oh, look at this. Yeah, so I went walking with my grandfather, he took his goats out for a walk, and I really wish I'd brought something to carry all this fungus in, because I brought home, like, a salad bowl-sized thing of different fungi. <laughs> <laughs> and I rewatched your thing on drawing mushrooms, and, um, yeah, I had to go at it. Oh, this is so much fun. I love the Let's hold it closer to the screen, if you would. Just what's going on with these textures? is really fun. Yeah, well, there was so much going on texture-wise. You got the, I think they're called bleats, uh, that have almost like a sponge underneath. And then I think these are called the elephant saddle, where mm -hmm. they are just absurdly textured, kind of like a morel, but a little crazier. Yeah, um, well, the, 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 uh, the stipes of those, with those, uh, the kind of deep grooves in them, and sort of interlocking pieces. That's yeah. really fun. And look at the, the cool blushes of color on the base of that bow lead. Yeah, and then the other neat thing is that with mushrooms, you can just cut them in half so easily, um, which makes for some really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Like this one, um, I opened it up and found that a little worm had gone inside and just eaten up everything. And so it was like, you know, a little mush of, worm droppings and whatnot that was just full of the, well, that filled up the stalk of the mushroom. Oh, that's really, really fun. And um, the the way you're showing, uh, just make, get it closer to the screen again. Yeah. And once with some of these really textured tops, look at how um, Kate's using sort of variation in the application of the watercolor to really kind of suggest these um, wrinkles and and highlights. So she's dropping color into those places where there's where it's dropping back. That one really interesting one on the right hand page where you're seeing some of the gills underneath. And uh, this one. No, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, no. sorry. Our 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 right, <laughs> your left. Okay, gotcha. Um, yeah. Um, you know, the, notice how you really get the sense that you're 
um, there's the part of the, the cap is raised up there. Um, so there's just enough of a kind of definition on that, that, that edge that you really, we can still really understand the structure of what's going on here. This is fun. This is really fun. Yeah, I thought you'd like that page. I might have one or two other things to show you. Um, oh, I had a Roadrunner sighting. Um, <gasps> oh, cool. Yeah, I was pretty happy with how that turned out. Um, oh, yeah. And I like you know, that's, not so much. When they, when they give you your the backside, we, we draw the backside. You know, just flow yeah. with whatever nature gives you. Oh, and then here's some seabirds. <sighs> oh, um, my goodness. That I was trying to do what? just quickly while on the boat. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, so you're you're bouncing around on a boat, kind of getting the sense of these things. Nice angles on the foreheads of these. It really kind of oh, thank you. Uh, helps us, you know, uh, tell tell a mer from a scoter. Um, that's neat. I'm um, also on that uh, that sort of lower uh, mer there. Um, notice how uh, Kate's got you know, some places where. Um, we're pushing the darks other places, letting just sort of a light wash of watercolor be light reflecting on it. And how you handled the reflection in the water on that one, I really, really like. Over this one? Yeah. Yeah, well, it was kind of fun was I had um, watercolors and then I just do like light wash, try and like hold it up into the wind to let it dry. And then I just have this little brush pen, which I think just the zebra one. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like just the right size for doing stuff like this because you can do big bold lines really quickly and then you can add in like little detail lines mm -hmm. um yeah oh, that's pretty, cool pretty new sketchbooks I think that's most of what i've got um i did some mushrooms i found so here's like the difference of doing it off of photos they're just not quite as good mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. still it, it, it's fun it's playful uh, but yeah. you, you you can't your brain can't wrap around it 3D in the same way, and then that you can you can you you're limited by just sort of what that photograph shows. Yeah, exactly. And I had been so reliant on photographs for most of what I did that um, kind of taking that leap and doing stuff um, from things that are in front of you just is so much bigger. Well, you know, it gives you so much more input. So uh, wh where were you out on the boat? Um, I came out of Monterey Harbor. We went out past Point Pinos, a um, couple of miles looking for whales. Usually what we do is we head out towards Moss Landing, try and get out into the middle of the bay and then start heading um, uh, towards like Point Pinos, Big Sur and try and like find a pod and kind of stay with them in the sailboat because they don't really mind you being there so much if you're not in the power boat you kind of just cruise along and they'll come over and check you out oh fun were any whales that day yeah um i think we saw some minky whales actually i'm trying to oh. draw well that's not working is it here we go yeah oh. not my best work but we'll see i haven't drawn whales oh, in a while so they have an odd shape to make look right yeah and and then you know you're only seeing a little piece above the surface yeah, well, it's really interesting to think that it's not until really recently in modern history that we've even known what um, alive whales in their full form really look like, because like historically people would only see whales dead washed up on the beach or sort of, you know, uh, the glimpses that you see when they come out. Um, so we live kind of in a really interesting time where we can see that full view of this is what whales look like, especially with drone photography for um, whales. That's been so mm -hmm. cool to see become a thing. Well, that's fun. That's fun. Or yeah, you realize that uh, uh, orca have a heart on their back when yeah. uh, <laughs> if you see them from a drone. That's really cool. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, um, any course. dolphins so uh, show up on your trip out there? Not this time. Not I this was time. really hoping to see the Riso's dolphins, but no luck. Those, those but there was one stars. really odd thing. Um, we had sea otters, none of them by the coast. They were all out in the middle of the bay, which is really odd because normally they hang out in the kelp, they hang out in shallow yeah. water to avoid, you know, sharks. They were all out in the open water in the middle of the bay. I'd never seen that before. And, and you know, you think that it's hard for them to, you know, even swim down and get an urchin at that depth in the middle of Monterey Bay. 
What yeah, were they so doing I, out there? Didn't right? they get the memo? I think we saw maybe like 20 otters out there. My sister and I were just baffled. That um, is a fun mystery. It's neat mm-hmm. when, when animals don't behave the way which we think they're supposed to behave. There's something more interesting going on there. So there's something, there's something going on in the otter department that um, we ought to pay attention to. Right. That's cool. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. That was a really fun uh, uh, set of journal pages. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, let's um, jump over to our friend Jack and Ray Bonto. Um, so let's start with, uh, let's see, Jack, you can unmute. And hi there, my friend. Hey. Um, so here's from today. I, um, at first my mom printed out the sheet for me, but at first I didn't have it. So I got out, um, this and I know there's some skulls in there. So I tried to make my own, but I'm not very good. I had, oh yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, great. This little guy's, um, I think I overdid it with the paint, but. I, he just looks a little overdone, little house finch. Well, the um, I, I like how you are are pushing the, the 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 values and the colors with this house finch, um, and you do have you really got um, the shape and proportions of that, and that's something that a lot of people get so wrapped around. I've got to you know match colors or something like that, but they don't get the proportions. This really feels house finchy to me. And um, we put out lots of seed outside for um, the snow before the snow came. We had we got snow here, and tons of birds were there. So the blue jays were very bossy. Um, some cardinals. Oh, fun, fun. Oh, this is this is a, an exciting page that. The the Jays Jays Cardinals is that the uh, is that the red naped woodpecker which which woodpecker is that I think it's a red bellied woodpecker red bellied yeah the, uh, yeah I um, I, <clears throat> I found myself recently on the East Coast and I was just going like I don't know any of these characters that, and, that, that's such a good looking bird and I had a really cool hawk hawk experience like last week I think. Like I was just in our butterfly garden and which is shaped, it's like a weird shape. And I was at the very end of it. And um, I'm just looking down on nature journaling. I'm journaling this little um, plant right here. Yes. And I hear this huge whooshing of wings and I look up and crows must've been chasing this hawk cause he was going like top speed towards me and i must have surprised him like i guess he didn't know i was there and he's trying to like turn around so his wings are like this right in front of me he's like doing his whole whole hawk call and everything he's like ah, ah. like i'm very bad at it but he and he's like <sighs> right in front of me and then he goes off crows hot in pursuit oh wow that Not, is that is like crazy cool like three meters in the air in front of me. That's, that's fantastic. Just, just, uh, just hawk in your face. You know, if, if, when we kind of get out and we're paying attention, these things every once in a while happen, but if we're not kind of getting out into the field, we have none of these experiences. Good for you for being out there. Um, sometimes, you know, when you're still and quiet in a place, nature comes to you. I was only there for like, I was only there for like five minutes too. So it's, yeah. That's fantastic. Could I, could I see those, uh, that, uh, those, those birds one more time? Yeah. That's a page with a J. Let me, let me remove my page. So it'll make yours, uh, remove spotlight. Uh Uh-huh. Oh yeah. Yep. Oh, and you you really understand the patterns on the on that jay. I was uh, I'm not, not familiar with blue jays because out here on the west coast I've got scrub jays and and scrub jays, uh, stellars and scrub. And the um, 
I was looking at a blue jay and just going, I am absolutely baffled by these, these patterns. I eventually looked at some photographs to understand the patterns on the head, but this is exactly, but you really um, have got your brain wrapped around this bird. That's, uh, that's really cool. Those strange little, on the face, there are these weird places where they, like the dark is coming up, these little white spots. I'm like, what's going on there? That's neat. Hey, thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Hey, good to see, see you, Jack. Um, we're now um, going to join um, uh, Ray Bonto um, over in uh, London. And if I can find you again. Uh, Ray Bonto, could you use the raise hand function again? And then you, ah, there we are. Hello. Hi, so I just turned it off because it would block my drawing and I did it too early, <laughs> sorry. Uh, no worries. <laughs> but I drew it again. Um, uh... I need to print that, but I decided, okay, I'll draw it all the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, just really solid line work, Ray Bonto. Um, that's that's so much fun to see. Um, it just it it really has a has a sense of um, dimension to it, and also I like your line variation where you're pushing your line where. Like look on that that lower one there, uh, kind of you come around the bottom of that eye socket. He's going with a lighter line and then up onto the zygomatic arch on that little bump, pushing the the uh, and emphasizing that line there. It really pulls that part of the drawing towards you. If Ray Bonto had used an even weight line all the way through it, that part of the drawing would really flatten out. Um, so great job on your line variation. Yeah. Thank, thank you. I, I haven't had any nature journaling opportunities lately, but well, 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 some, some, somebody's got uh, somebody took your your palette. Um, the uh, so uh, sorry, we've got your palette now over here in the states, but we're going to get you a uh, be sending you a new palette, um, and uh, so your package was safely received. Um, um, Ivea, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Um, let's, why don't we both uh, sort of join in here in gallery view. Um, add spotlight. Um, because I wanted to, to share something that, uh, that, that came from you. Is it okay if we share this with the group? Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Check that out. So this 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 deep water view of the the, the minky here, kind of um, kind of coming in and just sort of dropping down. Look at this sort of the foreshortening on the body, the way the colors are the the the, the water colors are just playing with each other, and then over here, um, look at the value range and the lights and the darks. That this is such a complicated form and texture. And you really, uh, the, so folks, these are, are, are Ray Bonto's paintings of, of whales that he sent us. So you really get a sense of the texture. So the different texture of the, the, the water splashing up, pouring down, um, the, the, the pleated throat here of this humpback, um, and then the, the different texture in there in the baleen that you see in that open mouth. That is really, exciting. This is really, really exciting, Ray Bonto. Um, let's see what you've got there, Ivea. I've got this one and this one just, it totally made my day when you sent it to me. So thank you for this, Ray Bonto. Um, just this beautiful, what kind of whale again? I, I remember you told me. Well, Hed, um... And, yeah. and you can sort of see the part that is out of the water, the part that's uh, under the water, really, oh, so, so exciting. And the baby shining, shining in the light. It's beautiful. 
it's actually white um but <laughs> yeah yeah oh th- this is this is really wonderful and and you you don't shy away from a challenge right um you know a lot of people would say like um i think i'm going to go for something kind of a little bit easier but you 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 dive in and you you embrace that challenge and um and you you put in the pencil miles and it makes a huge difference um Spoiler. so what uh jack, jack did you get to read the oh okay can, can i share the inside yeah. of this one yeah certainly <laughs> so so this one on the inside there is these these cool diagrams of feeding foraging strategies among orca and um which are, are if, if you know if you kind of take a look at that that's <laughs> it's really fun and you see ex- uh, all these different sort of these these foraging strategies of the orca over here is whale phylogeny um so both you and i like geeking out on these sorts of things so that's really cool the back side of this shows the strategies of bubble netting by humpbacks and how they kind of blow bubbles in a ring concentrate uh, krill and prey in the center and then come up the middle of it a challenging thing to describe and these uh, sketch notes of the whole behavior really really cool um this is is so exciting thank you well it took me two days for emia's drawing two days for jack's splash one uh, so two days each <laughs> Yeah. No. And 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 it's not overworked. Um you know you're you're you know you these you really kind of get the sense of the light in places where you've left the lights in the um in the watercolor. You know, I it, it, this this makes me really happy. Um I am really grateful to you for um for sharing this with me. I mm-hmm. love the colors on yours also uh Ivea, that and sort of where sort of the definition between where we're underwater, where we're above the surface, that's really neat. I keep this one behind me so that whenever I come into the room, I can see it because it always makes me smile. Thank you, Ray Bonjo. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Yeah, Heather's pointing out uh, this is another um, another we're sort of seeing another breakthrough in your art development. Um, You know, you keep pushing your own boundaries. And so that's why you keep breaking through them. And we're really proud of you. We are really, really proud of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, my dear friend. Um, We're going to get a a, a pallet. um, New pallets are being made um, very soon and we're gonna be getting you a a, a fresh one uh, uh, off to you as soon as we can. That was fun. It's fun. Um, let's, um, now bouncing back over to my gallery view, um, let's join uh, Walters uh, on the Canary Islands. Okay. Um, so I told last time I would share this so uh, people. Uh, can uh, have a look at this book. This was the uh, John Busby Birds in Mallorca. And uh, well, this one is my favorite uh, so far by him. So, and there's added value to this uh, because there's a beautiful kind of like a um, writing to somebody uh, named Ben is wishing his dad a happy 65th birthday from uh, the year 1990. So that's an added value. And Aww. John Busby and John Busby has signed. No book. way. Oh. Yeah, because I checked this and if I swipe it a little bit, it kind of is coming off. So it's a marker. It's not kind of printed in there. That's really so. fun. Um, so, so yeah, uh, show, show us uh, a, a couple of examples of sketches in there that are, are sort of the style uh, aspects of John Busby's work that 
um, you yeah, well, really connect with, with? I think John Busby's kind of um, skill of showing birds in flight is really coming out the best in this book because just these gull sketches in flights and he does all of this in field. It's not from photographs or anything. So he's oh. looking at the birds and sketching them. So uh, these ones there, then he had uh, also some sketches of uh, beautiful kestrels over here. Um, just, oh, and these ones, these, uh, I think they're called uh, stilts. Yeah, stilts, yeah, stilts. They're called stilts, so these. Uh, sketches of the of their poses oh. and these are not with a pencil these are these are with a uh, ink so that's a bit of a change of, in his style in this book so it's uh this one's very uh, beautiful more some some more stilts oh boy look at i mean just i mean the, the, his ability to catch these sort of fleeting moments um uh of uh, is is just so wonderful like the, the bird is just in this pose for just a second and it is. um <clears throat> he also has oh there's some uh kestrels in flight so just these he has like field sketches and like kind of paintings painting style uh yeah. drawings in here also so um but it's beautiful and mallorca is not that far well it's it it's in it's spain so uh, he's uh he's been uh, going to uh, mallorca a lot as he describes it in his book there was one Beautiful, also landscape paintings, which I really liked in here. Mm, where was it? Oh, this one with the kind of like the sailboat. This one's beautiful, also. So oh. it's a fantastic book. Oh, that that guy is. It just it is it is so inspiring. That's that is so inspiring. Um, yeah, these these are the uh, birds I told you once about the hoopoes, oh, hoopoes, hoopoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are also here on the Canary Islands. I actually saw I saw a couple of them, but only once when I had my journal. So a quick sketch. I did a quick sketch of it, but very showed itself for like twenty seconds. So yeah, I've. I've do you, do you have John Busby's Drawing Birds book? A Drawing board, Birds, yes, I have. And have, um, yeah. and then he also has that. Um, let me let me grab a couple of. Well, well I'm going to run over to my shelf. I'm going to grab a little bit of uh, John Busby work um, there. In the meantime, show show us another one that you think is particularly kind of John Busby game on. John Busby game on. Um, there was one with uh, oh these one these ones very good. So uh, these one with some uh, shags over here, and uh, he also uh, he just he just so casual about like to capture these poses. It's it's very hard to capture these, but he he writes. A young shag preening on a jetty at Porto Colum. A shag preening is an endless source of delight to any collector of bird shapes. So it's a uh, very, very cool drawings here. Oh, what a great way to think about it, being a collector of bird shapes, right? Yeah. Uh, um, I'm having a hard time on my bookshelf finding the uh, John Busby ones that I've wanted to um, kind of I also have uh, I also have here looking at birds which was the antidote uh, to field guides oh, yes also, yes uh, so the, the 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 writing in that hold that one up 
um, I think is also really Which interesting. One? The the uh, the uh, looking at birds. Second. Um, so yeah, it's it, it it's um it's an invitation just to be real a, a real really present with um with with looking at at, at birds and sort of uh, appreciating. Uh, appreciating light, appreciating behavior, appreciating um, uh, not just the species list. Um, it's a, yeah, that's a, that's a really fun book. Uh, that's, 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 that's a, that's, uh, but the, that, that Birds of Mallorca, um, I didn't, that was not really on my radar. Um, but since you uh, suggested it, I've I have ordered myself one, beautiful. and I am looking forward to uh, um, to 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 flipping through that. Have your own journals? Uh, have you had a chance to do any of uh, more journaling yourself? Um, a bit. Now I'm kind of focusing on one area uh, because I'm going to do kind of a bit of a research. Uh, to one area so I've been but not a lot it's been rainy and uh windsurfing and so just these kestrels have been bought uh, here and uh mm. and then just uh, some writing about and then from today a bit uh some some uh, flower species that I yet have to identify and uh a gray wagtail showed up and uh but uh oh this is this is cool this is really cool and, and look at the cool that. posture study um on the wagtail there yeah it was it kind of jumped and um, there were these uh kind of little ponds in an old river bed because it's been raining here lately and uh, the wagtail just came up and it kind of i don't know Maybe it was to scare off, uh, like scare some insects, um, but it just kind of jumped up and its tail flicked like almost over its body, and its legs kind of dangling and just hovered there for like two seconds and came down. So, what a some strange, interesting behavior! I haven't seen that. That's a cool behavior. I'm glad you got a little freeze uh, memory moment of it. That's cool. That's yeah, remarkable. So. Yeah. That's, I agree with Kate. That's just, oh, and, just remarkable. Yeah. And finally, tone paper. Finally. <laughs> you know, you don't have to use the, uh, just go use the white ones first and then the tone. You can bounce around. Uh, I can, but I, I like, uh, like it that I can see like my oldest drawings are in the beginning and then I just mm. click through to my uh, latest ones. So your, your next I sketchbook, don't... are you going to go for toned paper or are you going to go for um, another white one? What's your choice going to be? I think we should vote. I think we should vote. We should vote. Okay. <laughs> um, no, because I cannot decide. I have a, a Strathmore, um, Strathmore 400 toned tan. Uh, but I wanted a um, either a Strathmore mixed media, which is going to be a pretty heavy paper, or a Fabriano sketchbook, the one with kind of like the bricks on the covers. I wanted the white one because I feel I could go like with a really uh, like 6B, 8B pencil and just go try a lot like John Busby style. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that paper on the tone 10 is it's quite slippery so uh so it's going to be hard for the pencil to catch on but maybe i should go to for the tone 10 um, it's just more interesting i guess all right so i've just created uh a uh, let's see. Um, I've never um, uh, done this before in uh, in Zoom, but I think I may have. Let me just see if um, I have been successful with this. 
Um, we've we've got so did it did it appear? Yeah, well, it's on my screen. I can. Okay. What kind of paper should Walters use? Yes. What, okay, so we're, we're, um, it looks like um, Strathmore is taking the lead here. Nine out of twelve. Three people have suggested the white Fabriano paper. Fabriano is good quality paper, but um, that toned paper is going to allow you to push those whites. Um, let us know. Let Walters know here. So, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I guess Strathmore tone ten it is. <laughs> Strathmore tone ten. Have you ever tried the tan, yeah. uh, the toned uh, gray paper? I am uh, bef not before this one, but like two sketchbooks back, I had the toned gray. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what you think of toned gray versus toned tan. Um, yeah, I think toned tan is gonna fit because it's like a pretty. Uh, toned gray goes great with snow, uh, I think. And, yes. But here it's uh, kind of like I could uh, play with the color of the paper so I don't have to color some places mm -hmm. because it's quite like sand color here. So uh, around. So yeah. Um, something of that. There is. Um, so have, have fun with that, I think. So we've got a, our choices made. Um, it is now, uh, yep, 63% of us decided, looks like toned tan it is. That's the first time I've ever done a poll. So <laughs> that's fun. Um, yeah, I once brought a toned tanned um, sketchbook to Tanzania on one of our safaris. Um, and that was, that was a fun one to have in, in that environment. Um, uh, very very cool to uh, to 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 see what's currently happening in that that sketchbook of yours. Yeah, hopefully gonna oh, oh, we're going somewhere probably in the weekend, so gonna get it filled up. Excellent. Happy journaling to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and and send me your address. Yes. Uh, I about the papers. I. Uh, my mom is an architect so she has those kind of papers but uh, oh. i think those but i think those are made out of like paper not they're not from plastic yeah oh, yeah so so, so this is this to... is this is um so this hold on a second i um decided to to look further into it and um, I looked in the Guild Handbook of Scientific Illustration. So this is this very sort of dense manual for scientific illustrators. And they had a section in there about painting underwater and they suggested Duralene drafting film. And so uh, the, uh, the, so if it's, so it's, a, it's actually a, a, the, the paper I will send you is, is plastic. Um, yeah. And uh, so if, if that's what mom has, you're probably in good shape. If that's not what ma, mom has, then um, uh, you got to send me that address and I yeah, will. I will. I have. I, I have this 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 packet of drafting film waiting for you. So. OK. Tonight. Gonna OK. Do that. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> It's really good talking to you. Yeah. Um, see you. See you soon. Um, let's uh, join, uh, bounce over to uh, Marin County, California. Uh, we're going to be joining um, Ann Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Scientists. Science. Um, a, and you can now, oops. Let me try that again. There we go. Yeah, I think you got it. And we're good. Hi there, it's good to see you. Hello, good to see everybody. I love seeing everybody's work, so beautiful. Um, and I've had a lot of fun. I got to go down to um, Pacific Grove last week and saw the monarch butterflies. They're back. They're back in huge numbers. I'm so excited because for the last couple of years, if you don't know, they just didn't show up. And um, you know, they come up to Pacific Grove to overwinter and this year they're back in the tens of thousands. So it's really That's, exciting. That, that is such, I, I, I thought that we were looking at uh, just the local extirpation. 
of uh, yeah. the extirpation of that um, of the the California overwintering monarchs. And yeah, that was that was brutal. <gasps> oh, so here's one. I'm going to share several pages. And actually, Melinda came down and met with me one day. Oh, what and fun! Joined me for some really what fun, fun. Um, nature journaling. And so, yeah, just had fun with the pages and lots of questions and observations. And um, it was so fun to be out in the field, nature journaling. I don't do it enough. So that was great. Um, there was a highlight, a um, crimson red landed on somebody's hat. The guy was wearing sort of a camouflage hat and the crimson red seemed to really, really like his hat. So. Really? <laughs> Kept landing on it. Um, couple more of those we did see them they were mostly on the cypress trees but um there were some that were in the sun on eucalyptus trees mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i got oh, to go back for is... a couple of days and then um of course the fun little oh! sea otters oh <laughs> so those were close to shore um <laughs> right out by spanish bay sort of and there was also a black DB that was just sitting on a rock and he'd jump up once in a while. And I think he was a little gnat catcher. He would, he would catch these little, I think there were gnats that were buzzing around. I like that also um, that, that pelican view um, of that, that group flying, oh, yeah. just soaring yeah. over with the, the little angles of the bills. That's <laughs> really fun. Oh, uh, what Yeah, great lots day. of brown pelicans. Um, was this at, um, Elkhorn Slough, where you're seeing those? Where, where were No, you? I was just out at a point, um, kind of at Spanish Bay, right before you get up into um, Pebble Beach, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. golf courses and stuff. So I just, I was out on my bike. I did um, about 20 miles each day along this 17 mile drive. And um, I would just stop. I had a little backpack to carry my nature journaling kit and then um would stop somewhere uh sit on a rock and and sketch so also got to see um gray whales way out in the distance but oh. the gray whales are migrating back north already and cormorants um oh you got the little the you place. got the little jump yeah Whoop. <laughs> that's, oh, hard that's, to capture. Oh, that's a really good way of showing that <laughs> and more otters and then this little black Phoebe. And I had to come back in and look at pictures to get this because my field sketching was like stick figures. It was not going well. So came back in and, and looked. And then just yesterday I went down to Schallenberger Marsh in Petaluma where Point Blue headquarters is um, and lots of avocets and just a couple of them were starting to get their breeding plumage, their colored the, the head turns sort of orangey. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I like the way you're showing the uh, feeding, both the, the, the flight posture and also the feeding behavior with that beak going back and forth yeah. right at the surface. Yeah, it kind of, they do a swooping motion to, to feed. And then it was so interesting. So I think in the Southern Lagoon there at Schallenberger, at first it was pretty shallow and they were feeding, they were very active. And then I think as the tide came up, they, they would sort of make their way into this, into the Northern pond. And there was just a place where they could, it was very shallow and they could all just rest. And they went into this very tight, probably 200 birds um, just resting there like for hours. I was there probably three hours and Got to see them feeding for a while and then they all flew north and just sat there so it was <sighs> fun to stay long enough to see their behavior that's that's really that's wonderful and plenty of coots and then um let's see northern shoveler and greaves and black neck stilt and sandpipers oh and you got to see the back side of the coot with the little with the little white spots <laughs> yep little white spots little and when points. when they get really kind of uppity in their display that that those that, that rump comes way up and those 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 turn into big big white spots ah i didn't know that so it really helped to have 
the John Muir Law's Guide. Um, ah, yay! <laughs> yay, so I had that with me. I keep it in my nature journaling kit. Um, so super helpful to have that reference. Thank you very much. Absolutely, I tried to make something. So it's waterproof, tearproof paper. I'm making um, uh, another one right now for San Francisco Bay. Yay. And then, sorry, I'm taking so long, but I'm reading a great book, The Practice of Practice. And oh. it's geared toward musicians and practicing music, but it's also very much about the growth mindset and about curiosity and wanting to learn and not trying to be perfect and slowing down and observing and it talks about Carol Dweck and you know growth mindset. So really good book. Oh, this sounds this sounds very very good. You know this is this is it's interesting that you should mention this. I need to write this down. This is um, I, I've been talking with my daughters a lot about the practice of practice and how that one of the most important things that they're learning right now is how to learn and how to practice. And um, this is the book for you. <laughs> Yeah, I keep thinking of, of you and, and your daughters and um, I think you'd really enjoy that. And then finally, um, this is almost too big to hold up. Um, somebody just gave me this yesterday um, wow. and it's photography of birds in flight and um, it'll be really fun to try to use this as source for sketching. And this photographer catches um, just so many great postures. The name of the book is what? 100 Flying Birds. And it's photography by Peter Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh. Um, A-U-G-H. Um, I wonder if I can get, uh, do we do a, a workshop on drawing birds in flight and get uh, Peter as a guest? Uh, great idea. I don't know this person. Um, somebody just gave me, it's a late Christmas present, but <laughs> the photography really is amazing. And um, sometimes he'll have, you know, three or four birds all together. Well, like here, a lot of birds. Um, so one shot and it captures all these different angles. Uh, to see wow. the birds. Yeah. So that'll be a fun practice, right? That's going to be fun. That's yeah. going to be really fun. <laughs> and thank you so much for sharing that. That is, um, that is really exciting work. It's great to be able to look into your journals and get that, um, mm -hmm. that, that inspiration. I, uh, I'll show you one note from my journal that, um, <laughs> note to self, field, practice, practice, practice. Um, yes. Like I yep. say, I was just getting like stick figures and had to come back in to like look at photographs and look at your um, tutorials on, on drawing birds to get something with some shape and proportions and everything. So it, it just made, it inspired me to go out and be in the field more and less sitting in my place at my computer or looking at a book. Well, I'm glad you're here today, but you're absolutely right. We've got to get more field time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Um, I would like to bring on Ivea the Mad Botanist. Uh, Ivea, it's great to uh, see you. Thank you for helping us manage the meeting. And um, what's going on in your journal these days? Okay, so first of all, I was playing with the moon the other night. So that was fun. Oh, I, there's a little ring around it. That's fun. I like that on that tone paper. I was trying to figure out how to capture the ring. And then I was drawing um, the craters and I, and I was thinking I need to practice again because I was trying to spot the Sea of Crises and then I was wondering what do we call the parts where it's the eyes anyways and so I decided to instead of being worried about you know messing up or being a perfectionist I just decided to go for it. Um, I wanted to capture the ring around the moon especially just because it was so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
that effect that you get. And and I and I was wondering because you talk about rainbows, if if um, one side was, I mean, I guess it is a little bit obvious because in this case it's the moon, but of course the inside was a bit lighter than the outside. But now I'm thinking about daylight and looking at rainbows in the daylight. And then I was starting to write a poem, but I got to work on it. Um, oh, fun. That's fun. Do do, do you feel like re, re, uh, feel comfortable reading the the, the poem in progress? Or okay. do you want to, to wait on it? Maybe I'll wait, especially because my wait. writing's not very legible and it's going to be hard for me to read my own okay. writing. <laughs> um, but so folks, notice what um, Ave is doing on, on her poem, though. So she's getting the th initial thoughts down. And then you see these little, you can cross out things. You can add other little things in. You sort of change it. You modify it. It's not like you get it in the first pass. But... Um, getting in there and editing your poem, you can do that right on the page. Draw little arrows, insert things, cross things out, and that is a that's a wonderful strategy. Thank you. And then the other thing was that I have to thank you for this, and also the um, recent Morro Bay Online Bird Fest, because um, that was just all kinds of amazing. Um, here's the end result at least, but I can like flip through quickly and show my pencil miles. But I decided that I'm bound and determined to figure out who is the mustache snowdrop bird. And so I decided <laughs> to look at, um, at my two options because when I looked in your guide, my mouth fell open. I was like, oh, those two look just like snowdrop bird. And so I'm not sure which one um, it, um, he or she are. Um, so hopefully the next time I go to my restoration site, I'll hear the familiar rustling and see some bird jumping around and I'll oh, be able to zoom in. That's great. And and, yeah, and both the fox sparrow and the, the the hermit thrush are ones that do like to kind of root around there on the ground and uh, make a, make a make the bush rustle. So um, so that so what helped was also pointing out areas that they are different from each other. That's like great. The shape of the beak. Um, even even the dot shape is a little bit different, but that could just be picture um I, I credited bird pixel um because these ones look slightly more like arrows and yeah. these ones look a lot more like spots and then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how the throat looks in here um and that's very different than this look of like the mustache coming out like i don't know yeah yeah <laughs> um so thank you for that and thank you to the bird fest for like pages upon pages of pencil miles um yeah just thank you for all of the pencil miles that you and the bird fest helped us to do um oh, yeah and you were at the sfbbo last night too oh i like your can with legs yep yep can with legs um gosh let's see here more birds um how to draw birds that you taught us um ponder recovery um didn't manage to draw it fast enough um let's see here bird by ear thank you for that the lady who led that one learning about this the syrinx and the way that the birds have split vocals and that's why they can make the noises so quickly and also make them at the same time so no matter so that's why a lot i think that a lot of people are actually really good at bird calls but that's why if you can't you can just blame the fact that you don't have a syrinx you that's right a, you have a larynx <laughs> Um, and then this, this was, this was a fun one to try to draw. Um, there was this sunshine, um, red tailed hawk. And so she gave us her back at one point and I was trying to draw the stack of feathers and I was thinking about you and I was like, yeah. Jack would totally be all over this. And so trying to draw, um, her a bunch while she moved. So hooray for pencil miles and stuff. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's really fun. And... Last but not least, I've been out in the field. So talking about um, the leaves, I decided to try again to make some prints. Um, I decided to try on one of them. I did what I was taught, which is where you, is that the back one? Um, yeah, yeah, this was, the, this was the back side of the leaf. And I thought, eh, that didn't turn out so good. What if I tried the front? And for some reason, the front turned out better when I was making it. Oh, interesting. Them. So that was kind of fun. Um, and then I, I wonder if the back works better for rubbings, but because those veins are sticking out so much on the back side, and the top side would be smoother, that you get a better print with the ink on the top side. Never thought about that. I think so. I think that the um, paint 
or ink collects within within the, the divots of the veins and then you press it down and then they remain there so they don't slide off. Instead, they kind of hold the, the ink for you. Nice. And then I like to keep note of who is flowering and seeding and everything else like that, bearing fruit. Um, and then my, my notes of crazy, yeah. Oh, you have been putting in so many pencil miles. That's really fun. I, I've, I've got a few pencil miles in a few kind of, you're seeing your native, um, your, your, your notes on who's blooming. Oh, and that's that. really fun. And then lots of sketching. So yeah, I've got to say thank you for always encouraging us to do pencil miles. Um, it, yeah, been having a blast. So thank you. You, you are you you are rocking it. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I've got a few. Uh, I've got a few uh, kind of new things. I went. Um, I was down near the Monterey area um, and found my first Johnny Jump Ups of the year. And there was a deer with these sort of um, mutations in the antler arrangement. So one side just had a stick coming up, the other side had a Y and all of these little sprouts in the middle of its head. Um, that was kind of fun. So this deer did not get the memo on, on how to, to build antlers. Um, I also um, um, had a, 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 somebody had found a uh, Western screech owls um, in a little pergola. So you, Carolyn and I could stand right down here underneath them and look up and it was just sitting right there, just snoozing away. And of course, down on the ground underneath it, there were, um, there were owl pellets from Western screech owls. And that's what the yogurt container is for. And just wanted to share those with you folks. The biggest one was this one. And isn't that cool? It's all, this one has, appears to have a whisker in it. So somebody who had a whisker, but most of this, most of this little pellet and most of the other ones are smaller like this. This one also with a whisker, right? Or actually maybe that's not a whisker. I don't know what that is. Um, so that is, um, uh, that's if you, those little shiny uh, orange and black things, that's all insect parts. So, um, there's clearly parts of Jerusalem crickets and carabid beetles. Um, these little ones are eating, are, are eating those. So that's. That's fun. I've got a collection of um, owl pellets from different species. And, um, but it's, it's fun to have these ones that are, where it's clearly this beastie is just being, you know, busting uh, out as an insectivore. And that's neat. Um, now, um, I'm gonna bounce over to our gallery one more time. Is there, Anybody else that wanted to share something? And not seeing that, I'm going to be turning off our recording um, in just a moment. Before I do, I want to encourage folks to get out there um, and, um, and, and fall in love with the world with your sketchbook in your hand. Just the process of having that with us helps us to look and look again notice details we otherwise would not have seen and remember them so much more vividly. Um, don't worry about the whole art thing. That is a, sk a skill that will come through putting in pencil miles. And you're really seeing that in, in people's journals. You know, it's, it's these, these people who are like, like I did this and this and this and this and this and this. Like the more pages you put in, the, um, the more that you are going to, that this is going to, the skill will um, crystallize in your head. You, so to kind of create the place for that, you want to put in some pencil miles. 
And it makes, that's the most important thing, it makes a huge difference. Um, let's take care of ourselves, each other, and this beautiful planet that we have the, 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 the privilege of, 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 of sharing for a little period of time. Um, and thank you all for being here today.